So communications was a huge topic that was discussed in both sessions. It was discussed that it was not just an issue of, um, it's not an issue anymore about there being enough information, but it's more of an issue of um, navigating um, what information is accurate um, and from a trusted source um, and where to find that information. Um, we can see here there's a consumer quote um, that you can't just translate generic messages and that's it. You need to also include cultural considerations. So when we're talking about um, communications being tailored for our community members, um, it's going beyond just changing the language, but also working with community to um, identify the cultural considerations and the social norms within their own within their communities that may be more relatable um, through the content. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to Tale to talk about how um, they tailored um, the communications up in the MTA um, in the Torres Strait um, for their community um, and how it was community led. Thank you. So when COVID first hit our region in late December, um, there was you know immediate panic about um, getting COVID and how to manage COVID once you did get it. And I saw that quite a lot of the communications products on Facebook and more generally were one in English. So there was that immediate kind of, you know, um, it didn't feel you couldn't connect with it because it's in it's in English, it's not in Creole and it's definitely not in any um, Torres Strait Islander or Aboriginal languages. Um, and the other thing was that it was very generic. So it was just the, you know, maintain physical distancing, um, wash your hands for 20, 20 seconds or more, um, just very generic messaging that didn't really apply to um, daily life activities and certainly not daily life activities in communities. So, you know, for our community, it's um, familial community. So that means pretty much everyone in here is related to each other. And so when you see someone at the shop, you don't just not say hello to them you don't just not embrace them or you know whatever it is you you say hello um you hug each other you you're very close with each other you you get close to each other so that was definitely um one aspect in terms of like a cultural consideration so i made a tile that was like you know how to to respectfully have that conversation and say oh sorry ama um no, I'm not gonna come close today because um, because of COVID, like good ways, we can still say hello like this, but we need to keep a distance. So just basic kind of giving people a bit of a template of what to do in that situation, because the last thing you wanna do is come up as rude to family members. Um, in terms of like uh, another kind of cultural or perhaps more social consideration is overcrowding in remote indigenous communities. A lot of the messaging that I saw didn't really reflect the reality of remote living. Overcrowding has been an issue for decades. It's definitely one the government knows about. Um, and it's not like as if it's a new, a new thing to deal with, but a lot of the comms didn't really show us how to manage COVID in a household, in an overcrowded household. Um, and so this tile, the purple one, talking about um, isolation tips, was to try and decrease the risk of other people in the household getting COVID. Um, so it, that was just a very practical tip, you know, putting a towel at the base of the door, um, ventilation. Other things like the, the lighter blue tile was just trying to show people just how many high touch surfaces there are. Um, and that's pretty common, like that's just not a, it's not like just a specific indigenous issue. It's um, just to, show the high touch things um, because you know I was seeing messages saying uh, wipe down high touch surfaces but you know it was words it was saying like um, door handles and whatever so showing an image of like a remote some people might not consider that like they might not consider that in their um, repertoire of high touch surfaces so just showing an image um, of, of things that are shared quite often, remote phones, chargers, wallets, you know, kids go grab the wallet from my bag, we're going to the shop kind of thing. Um, and the last tile I made a couple of weeks later when um, parents were getting worried about sending their kids back to school. And it was around that time when I think the Queensland government made the decision to um, push back school for a couple of weeks. 
and there was a lot of I guess anxiety in the community and you know a lot of Facebook commentary about kids and going back to school so I made this tile to try and like help parents talk to their kids about COVID so one of the examples that I used was imagine if one one of your kids had COVID and they were playing basketball with other kids and imagine if they sneeze they've got COVID on their hands imagine them touching the basketball passing that basketball to someone else that basketball going to someone else and playing like the I guess the example of playing basketball and how quickly germs can spread when just the one person um, has you know got COVID or has germs um, and to think of like germs as paint so if you imagine a basketball being touched by a lot of people the, the basketball will have paint all over so it was just trying to um, I get I guess get people to think about COVID in in different ways than other than the generic messaging that we were seeing and these were shared quite widely within the NPA and then it caught on to um, to Torres Strait as well. And then it was reshared by the Torres News and um, even our uh, Queensland government champion, Shannon Fentiman. Deadly. Um, so our last point that um, the consumers spoke about was um, more investment in community to distribute information. Um, mob know how to talk to mob. It is a missed opportunity when they are not utilised. So I think that um, when Tale was showing those examples of um, of the resources that she created, they were not only shared amongst community because she developed them, you know, like her and her community members and her networks were resharing um, that content because it was being shared by people who um, the community knows and who the community trusts. Um, so we know that there are already community champions in our communities. Um, they're already doing this work, um, but they're not equipped and resourced to, to do it. Um, and there's so much value in actually investing and ensuring that these community um, members and our community leaders do have the resources and, um, you know, the tools that they need to um, effectively communicate and distribute information. Um, especially in some of our remote and rural communities where you may, you know, you might have one health worker for um, several communities in several towns, especially at like, you know, in Central West and stuff like that. Um, we, where there is a, a lack of health staff um, in the communities, we can, you know, kind of counteract that with empowering community members to be sharing those health information, um, that health information. Um, so yeah, Tele, would you like to um, speak to how com community champions kind of work in your community too? Yeah, um, I I guess to the first point about um, supporting community champions, that'd be as simplistic as giving um, credit or helping with um, their Telstra plan so that they can you know get online and share their messages and maybe take a couple of videos and upload those videos i'm not sure if people are aware in remote areas like it can take 10 minutes to upload a 30 second video like that's how that's how much we struggle with tellers here um, and then all people downloading documents pdfs like the family plan um, or downloading resources is a bit of a struggle on phones and ipads and desktops even so um, if you're going to select community resources um, ask them what they need to get the message out and often you'll find it's you know a simple thing like credit um, if they, they can't really be vocal about something if they can't get on the platform um, another thing with organizations is like our organization um, we're pretty lucky because we have a color printer we have multiple color printers laminators, um, laminating sheets, so everything that we can get out, um, we can make it look a bit more formal and glow and um, looks like it has a bit more authority. Um, but some organizations don't have that and they don't have printing ink um, or they to invest in other, you know, colorful inks um, because sometimes they're just rushed or, you know, it's too just to have black and white. So they print stuff in black and white and might not be as aging to, to community members as if it were, uh, unless it was in um, in colour. Um, what else? Yeah, definitely uh, community, community champions. Um, 
I'm not sure what else to say around community champions, but I guess it's not always Okay, cool. So we just had a little bit of a technical glitch, but um, Talo was just finishing up um, with giving some tips about um, how um, community can be better supported to share um, and distribute information. Yeah, so just as I mentioned, um, you know, finding practical ways to support community champions, just asking them what they, what they need um, and also to, to also consider um, people who haven't been the opportunity to be a voice for their community, but um, and they're usually like younger people as well. So the community champions in in my region, um, they're generally, you know, always the ones selected to to be um, in leadership positions or elected to speak on a certain issue or given a lot of airtime for particular topics. Um, and I think it goes to a part of um, a part of like digital literacy and education um, for individuals to be given that opportunity to to be on a particular issue um, to give them that opportunity and that space to develop as a person so that you could use them for future um, because many of the the community champions in my region like they're all of an older age bracket um, and quite seasoned at speaking on particular issues which you know, makes them immediately um, enviable to, uh, not enviable, uh, immediately someone to, to look to for, for, those, um, for those roles. But it's also about fostering um, a cohort of young people who can talk about issues now and into the future. COVID's going to be around for a while. So a bit of forethought would be to engage young people and let them sit in with these older older um, champions and see how they talk and see how they assess information and and see and hear the discussions around having conversations with people and how to how to go about that in a delicate way and in a way that uh, these older champions have learned over time um, it's about fostering that next generation of community um, spokespeople as well as um, because because then when when young people are given that opportunity, um, they're going to want to, to share what they've learned as well. So it's a good way to get messages out as well as foster a new cohort of, of community champions. Yeah, and that was also um, a point that um, I hadn't mentioned yet, but we did have a young girl um, that joined one of our consultations. Um, she's actually um, a senior in grade 12 and she was in a boarding house and she was um, sharing with us that she's more likely to um, to listen to information, whether it be health information or anything else, um, from another young person. So um, it's just about that relatability, you know, like people want to hear um, information from people who they can relate to. And that's not always just people in community. It's all also, you know, um, people in community who they can relate to. All right, so um, this is our last slide, uh, which just kind of wraps up the rest of the presentation. So we didn't record all of the presentation. We just recorded the slides that um, we weren't able to really flesh out um, in the meeting. Um, so we provided the slides though um, to go back um, if any of you are interested. But this wraps up um, the conversations from last week. So we had more promotion about social supports. Um, so that's in particular um, when mob need to go into isolation, what social supports are there to uh, for them um, so that they're not actually going back out into community and risking um, you know, themselves and also other community members. Um, more priority testing and testing options, um, developing communications in partnership with communities, investing in community to distribute resources and investing in community to assess information. Okay, thank you. Thanks.